Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and this is H. Quincy Long, CEO and founder of Quest Trust Company, and today we're going to do something different. We usually talk about all the stuff you can do in your self-directed IRA. Today we're going to talk about what you cannot do in your self-directed account, and that's called prohibited transactions. So let's get rolling. First of all, of course, I have my disclaimer, as always. Quest Trust Company does not provide tax, legal, investment, or deal structuring advice, nor do we endorse any products, services, or investments of any type. All information materials are for education purposes only, and all parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment. So I've always got to have that disclaimer on there. Next, I always put this kind of bonus slide in here really it has nothing to do with prohibited transactions but basically it's tips to avoid scams and i just like to throw that in there because it's important so keep in mind when you're investing your self-directed ira that self-directed iras are most effective and least risky when you invest in what you know best if you go off and invest in things other than that you what you really know about it's more dangerous, but if you go and invest in what you do know about, you can mitigate the risk by your expertise. For example, the ones that, you know, everybody loses money on deals now and again, but the ones that I've lost money on have all been when I've veered off course and gone away from real estate, which is what I'm really good at. So anyway, keep in mind that invest in what you know best is a mitigation strategy. Scammers are very convincing at what they do. So always, always, always do your due diligence before making an investment. And I don't mean just due diligence on the property if it's a real estate deal or the company if it's not. But I mean prop due, due, due diligence on the people involved. For example, if you're investing in a company that's a startup company, you better check the people out that started the company and see if they have the correct kind of kind of uh, training and stuff to do this. A uh, clear example of this, for example, is I came across a, a, a memorandum on an investment deal, a private placement memorandum on an investment deal, and they were it was for a cannabis business. And in reading the prospectus, it was clear that these people had no idea what they were doing and they were trying to raise more money because they lost a lot of money in the first year of operations, so they wanted to raise some more money. That would not be one that I would invent, invest in, not because the cannabis business is not necessarily something that is a bad business, but it's something that uh, the doing the due diligence on the people involved and whether they were people that actually knew what they were doing or not would be very important in that point. And that's, of course, that wasn't a scam, I don't believe necessarily, but uh, scammers will use any kind of trick, any kind of way to get you to invest. So affinity fraud, for example, is very common. And they'll say you'll meet somebody and they'll be a fireman or, uh, or go to your church or at the VFW hall or something. They don't care, they'll use anything from religion to any other way that they can convince you that they're upstanding, good guys, but you always have to be suspicious and do your due diligence. Scammers are almost always in a hurry, almost always in a hurry. They will make you believe that if you don't make this investment right now, you will lose the opportunity of a lifetime. The more they want you to hurry, the more you should slow down and be cautious. Uh, this is, Every scam that we've come across uh, over the many years that I've been doing this, almost always they're in a super hurry. The claims made by scammers are almost always unverifiable. If you can't verify what they're telling you, it's probably your, your, your risk factors are way sky high in that. So, for example, I had a person approach me one time and they wanted me to invest in a company and they were so excited because they got all of the contract to produce educational films for the country of Poland. And I was like, no, that's not really something I want to invest in. But they were very excited about it. But the claims were unverifiable. You could not call the Polish government up and say, hey, can I see that contract? 
that's not going to happen. And fifth, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Be leery of somebody that tells you you're going to make, you know, a thousand percent return with no risk. It's just, uh, that's not, it could happen, but it's not typically the scenario. So what I really want to bring out about all these tips here is they're not all necessarily mean it is a scam. It means that these are red flags that need to be cautiously evaluated. For example, I had a, another investment that somebody proposed to me and said that they had invented a new way to make medical machinery talk to each other across different uh, hospitals and everything like that. And, I was, and they said, this is going to revolutionize the industry. And you know, it might have been true. But there was no way to verify it because they were still in secret testing. So I declined that investment because it just, I couldn't verify anything. So be careful. Do your due diligence on the people, on the property, on the companies, and you'll hopefully have a good result. So sorry about that little sidebar there. It's kind of a bonus slide, if you will. So we're talking about prohibited transactions today, and I love this little quote from Lead versus Commissioner in the U.S. Tax Court. And it says, We conclude that the prohibited transaction rules can, contained in Section 4971-75-C3 um, are just that. The fact that the transaction would qualify as a prudent investment when judged under the highest fiduciary standards is of no consequence. Furthermore, the fact that the plan benefits from the transaction is irrelevant. Good intentions and a pure heart are no defense. In other words, the rules are just the rules, and if you violate them, it doesn't matter if you intended to or accidentally did so, you're going to have the same negative consequences, which we will be discussing here. So there are three types of restrictions on IRAs. In most of our presentations, you hear us talking about all the benefits of all the things you can do, all the types of investments you can make, and the results. And it's all wonderful, but there are restrictions on self-directed IRAs. And they fall into three broad categories. People restrictions, or the disqualified person rules, transaction restrictions, and investment restrictions. And we're going to go over each of these in the presentation. So the first one we're going to go under is investment restrictions, and that's because it's the shortest section of the talk. Life insurance contracts are not eligible for investments in a self-directed IRA. Why? I don't know. That's just the rule. And they're not permitted. So you cannot, for example, get a life insurance policy on someone and bump them off to boost your Roth IRA. That would be a prohibited transaction. So keep that in mind. The next thing is, or the next category is collectibles. What's a collectible? Collectibles are defined in the code as a work of art, any rug or antique, any metal or gem, with certain exceptions we'll go over, any stamp or coin, again, with certain exceptions. My favorite, any alcoholic beverage. So if you find that Pablo Picasso painting in the garage sale, well, I'm afraid you're just going to have to buy that personally because you will not be able to put that in your IRA. And if you find that rare wine collection, just go ahead and drink it because you uh, can't put that in your IRA either. Now, there are exceptions for certain U.S. minted gold, silver, and platinum coins, coins issued by U.S. states, which I'm not aware of any, and gold, silver, platinum, or that wonderful stuff, palladium bullion. Those are all coins and uh, metals that you can invest in. That's why you see all the commercials for buy gold, buy gold, buy silver. Okay, so that's it. Those are the only investment restrictions. So anything else that you can document title to and convince a custodian to hold title to on behalf of your IRA, you should be able to invest in. So the next category is people restrictions. And these are disqualified persons. And disqualified persons are those persons who cannot benefit from or enter into transactions with your IRA or other plan either directly or indirectly. So you can't just stick an LLC in there and do a transaction with you. You just can't do it directly or indirectly. So what you got to understand is that there is you and Mr. Ira. And you think, well, Mr. Ira is not a separate person. That's my IRA. That's my money. 
but actually Mr. Iyer is a separate legal person from you, and furthermore, you are a fiduciary for Mr. Ira. And you have to take care of Mr. Ira. And it's true that eventually Mr. Ira is going to die and leave you all of his money or dribble it out in gifts. But until he does so, you're responsible for taking care of Mr. Ira's funds. And every decision you make has to be in the favor of Mr. Ira, not you or another disqualified person, because you are a fiduciary for his account. And so there's a line between you and Mr. Ira, and no transaction and no benefit can cross that line, either to you or any other disqualified person, which we're going to describe in a minute. So you're a fiduciary. So what's the definition of a fiduciary, and why would you be considered a fiduciary of your IRA? Well, fiduciary includes any person, in the key language here is, exercises any discretionary authority or discretionary control respecting management of such plan or exercises any authority or control respecting management or disposition of its assets. Well, that's exactly what you do as the owner of a self-directed IRA. You have every bit of control, discretionary control, how, over how it's managed and how it buys assets and how it disposes of assets. There's other fiduciaries that could come up. It doesn't have to be just you. But if you had an investment advisor, for example, or had any discretionary, any person who has a discretionary authority or discretionary responsibility in the administration of this fund, again, the discretionary part is key, then that's going to be a fiduciary as well. But you're falling under category A. So you are, in fact, and this has been ruled in court, you are, in fact, a fiduciary for your IRA. Now, besides other disqualified persons be tied to the fiduciary for the IRA, which is mainly you, the self-directed IRA owner, include a survival service provider. As example, if Quest Trust Company has your IRA uh, at our firm, then we're a service provider to that IRA, and Quest Trust Company is a disqualified person. And an employer but not all, just any employer, an employer who contributes to the plan. For example, at Quest Trust Company, many of our employees have chosen to have an HSA compliant plan from the selection of plans that we provide them with every year. And because we fund those HSAs with money from our business, we as an employer are disqualified persons as that HSA, HSA, so they have to have their HSA somewhere other than Quest Trust Company. But it's not just any employer. So, for example, if we had nothing to do with any of their IRAs or if we didn't contribute to their HSAs, then we would not be a fiduciary for that purpose. So I'm not a fiduciary, a disqualified person. So keep that in mind. It's employers who contribute to the plan and not just any employer. Also an employee organization. So here would be, for example, if you had a union-sponsored plan, that union is clearly going to be disqualifying from doing business with uh, or benefiting from transactions in that pension fund, for example. And because of these four categories of people, you have other people that, because of their close relationship to that party, are also going to be deemed to be disqualified. So for a fiduciary has a whole list of people that because of their relationship with the fiduciary and the fiduciary is disqualified, they also are disqualified. So for example, members of the family of the, of the fiduciary are disqualified. So what's the definition of family? Disqualified members of the family are defined only as a spouse, an ancestor, a lineal descendant, and any spouse of a lineal descendant. So that's your sweetie pie, your wife or your husband, your parents, your grandparents, your kids, their spouses, their grandkids, their spouses. All those people are mem members of the family for prohibited transaction rules, and they cannot do business with either directly or indirectly or benefit from those transactions. Now, I have to caution you at this point, because although the other members of the family are not disqualified persons, for example, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, stepchildren, stepmothers. Those are not disqualified persons. They're not on the list. 
but they may still be a problem to do business with those family members even though they're not disqualified themselves because there is always always at least one prohibited person involved or disqualified person involved in doing any kind of uh, self-directed IRA transaction and that is you the fiduciary because you're making a decision and in the IRS audit manual which you know I like to read periodically uh, it says included within the concept of an indirect benefit to a fiduciary is a benefit to someone in whom the fiduciary has an interest which would affect his or her fiduciary judgment so for example if you married uh, a second time and you had kids or she had kids and you those kids were young they grew up you know treating you as their dad clearly if you did a transaction with them although a stepson or a stepdaughter is not on the list and therefore is not a trans a prohibited party the problem is that you are a disqualified party uh, to your IRA and a benefit to someone who you love is going to be likely to affect your fiduciary judgment and therefore could be an indirect prohibited transaction. The focus is not on the family member who may not be a disqualified person, but rather on the indirect benefit to the fiduciary, i.e. the IRA owner, who is a disqualified person. And it's very tricky stuff, so be careful. Now, we're just going to go over the disqualified persons that are related to the fiduciary. And so the fiduciary, again, includes the IRA owner, members of fiduciary's family, including ancestors, descendants, their spouses, lineal descendants, the spouses of lineal descendants, as we just discussed, are all disqualified persons because of their close relationship to the fiduciary. But also, if the fiduciary owns directly or indirectly 50% or more uh, of the voting power or the value of stock, or 50% or more of the capital or profit interest in a partnership, or 50% or more of the beneficial interest in a trust or estate, that corporation, partnership, trust, or estate is a disqualified person and cannot do business with your IRA. So let me give you an example. Suppose there is a IRA that owns a piece of real estate and the IRA owner's son owns a property management company and he is the best property manager in the world. Still, the IRA cannot have the son's corporation uh, or business provide the services because the entity is disqualified. And once you disqualify the entity, any 10% or more partner or joint venture, any officer or director, any highly compensated employee, and in 10% or more shareholder or partner or co-beneficial interest, all those parties are pulled into the definition of disqualified persons. So once you're disqualified, it's you and anybody who you're closely related with and any employees, key employees, or managers or trustees or, or officers or directors are all pulled into the definition of disqualified persons. So you got to be careful with this. Now, besides the service provider, as an example, also has people that they're too close with. So, for example, and I own the majority of Quest Trust Company, so therefore I would be a disqualified person as the CEO and, and one of the owners of Quest Trust Company. Uh, I personally would be a disqualified person to do a business with or to benefit from my the IRA transactions, which... Uh, I service or Quest services. Same thing with an employer. If an employer is disqualified, then certain people related to that employer are going to also be disqualified. And the same thing with an employer employee organization. Again, if there's a union sponsored plan, the trustees of the plan are not going to be allowed to do anything. Uh, that sort of idea. Okay, so those were the people, the disqualified people that we discussed who cannot enter into a transaction. Well, you can do almost anything. So what is it that these people can't do? Because uh, the self-directed IRAs are very flexible. 
So what can't they do? So these are the transaction restrictions. And it's, it's either any direct or indirect. Every one of these starts with direct or indirect. So we've got to understand that direct or indirect language. We'll get to that. So you can't have a sale, exchange, or a lease of property between an IRA and a disqualified person. So if you own a piece of property, and you want to get that in your IRA, you can't sell it to your IRA, nor can you buy property owned by your IRA without taking it as just simply a distribution. And no disqualified person can lease property owned by the IRA. A simple example of that would be if your IRA owned a piece of property and it wanted to lease that property out to your mother so your mother wouldn't have to move in with you and interrupt your kind of way of life, that would be not permissible even if the mother paid fair market rent for that IRA-owned property because she is a disqualified person as your ancestor and therefore cannot lease a property owned by your IRA. That's just one example. Another example would be if your IRA owned a, a property on the beach in Belize and you thought, well, can I go down there and check it out and stay in there and I'll, I'll pay the management company the full fair market value. Sorry, cannot do that because you're a disqualified person, nor can any of those other family members do it either. So that's just a easy examples there. You can't have any direct or indirect lending of money or other extension of credit. You, know, you can take a distribution and repay it within 60 days once a year. That's called a rollover, a 60-day rollover. But as far as actually loaning money between an IRA and a disqualified person, that's not going to work. So we'll see some examples, more complex examples of this later. But just take the idea of if you're wanting to enter into a real estate contract and it's the weekend, can you just front the money for the earnest money? Or do you, is that an extension of your credit or loaning of your money short term? Though it is, the answer is no. Because if your IRA is going to do the transaction, the IRA has to front the money. And you can't loan the money even on a short-term basis to the IRA, nor can the IRA loan you money on a short-term or long-term basis. It has to be not done that way, but the IRA has to do it directly if it's going to buy that property. Now we get to the probably one of the trickier ones. You can't have a direct or indirect fund furnishing of goods, services, or facilities between an IRA and a disqualified person. What the heck does that mean? Well, I think some of it's easy. For example, if you had a warehouse, could you store all your stuff? A warehouse in your IRA, could you store all your stuff in it? Clearly the answer is no, you can't do that. If your IRA owned a piece of property, could you provide all the materials for someone else to build a house on it? Well, no, that would not work either. That would be a furnishing of goods to the IRA. Then we get down to the really tricky one. Can you provide services to your IRA? The answer is no. The problem is that nobody knows what services means. And so, generally speaking, I think there's a dichotomy, a, a difference between investment type activities. For example, I believe you could research all you want to to find good deals that's not providing a service, or that's my view. That's not an official legal opinion because, one, we can't give them, and two, there's no case that defines this specifically. But that's not a service. That's an investment activity. But when you cross the line and start providing services to your IRA, that's a problem. So clearly you could not, for example, go and use your own labor and materials to build a house on an IRA, on an IRA-owned piece of property. That would be providing services. It gets a little hazier. Could you provide services if you were, say, I don't know, a real estate agent? Could you for free represent your IRA in a transaction? I think the answer to that is no. And it kind of goes from there, and we'll kind of discuss this as we go along. I do want to say that it's much more fun to do this talk live before an audience because you'll have a lot of interaction, and I usually have a lot of questions about this. But we're stuck with what we do, and IRA Quest Trust Company does have a lot of IRA specialists that can't give you legal advice, but that kind of guide you down the path of what you need to consider 
with your own legal counsel. So give us a call if you have questions. Let's move on. Now this is a mouthful right here, but it's transferred to or used by or for the benefit of a disqualified person of the income or assets of a plan. That is a mouthful. And what the heck does that even mean? And remember, this is either any direct or indirect benefit. So that means that no matter how you slice or dice it, if you're entering into a transaction with your IRA, and either you or another disqualified person is going to get some kind of benefit, it's going to be a prohibited transaction potentially. So, for example, <clears throat> if you had that beach house in Belize that we talked about earlier, and you go down there and say, I'm going to stay there for two weeks and check it out as my duty as a fiduciary. No, that's not going to work because you would be making personal use or benefit out of assets belonging to the plan. And the benefit, it, it can be very intangible. For example, I heard of a case where a law firm represented work, workers' comp claims. And so they took their 401k plan and they loaned the 401k money to their clients. The clients were not related to the lawyers. So that should have been fine, they thought. But the, law, the tax court ruled, no, that was not fine. Because by making the loans, even though the loans were all paid off, by making the loans, it allowed the, the law firm to attract customers and retain customers so they can process their claims. And that was an indirect benefit to them and a the use of the income or assets of the 401k for their law firm, the personal benefit of the law firm. So that's how sensitive it gets. We'll see another case of that later. Then you come up with one that you kind of scratch your head out because it kind of sounds really like this similar to the prior one. And in fact, any violation of D, if it's done by a fiduciary, is going to be a violation of E too. And any violation of E is certainly going to be violating D. So it's kind of curious how, how this came about. But anyway, this is an act by a disqualified person who is a fiduciary. So this only applies to fiduciaries, not other disqualified persons, such as uh, a... Uh, service provider or something like that, but only a person who is a fiduciary, whereby he deals with the income or assets of its, uh, ass of its plan in his own interests or for his own account. Again, you can read that and the prior one and conclude that just about every time you violate one, you violate the other, unless you're not a fiduciary and you're violating it in some other way. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that one. Finally, you can't have any indirect, direct or indirect, receipt of any consideration for his own personal account by any disqualified person, again, who is a fiduciary, so that would include you as the IRA owner, from any party dealing with the plan in connection with a transaction involving the income or assets of a plan. The clearest example I can come up with here is a realtor. So for, suppose a realtor says, well, I can't take a commission. I know that Be, when I'm representing the IRA, I'm sorry, back that out. A realtor says, well, I'm not, the IRA is not paying me a commission. Suppose the IRA is buying a property and the IRA says, the realtor says, I know that the IRA can't pay me a commission because I'm a disqualified person to the IRA, but I'm also a fiduciary to the IRA. So even if the seller of the property, who is the one who pays the commission, pays me, I'm still getting a, a direct benefit from a transaction that the IRA entered into. And even though that money's paid by a third party, it's still a prohibited transaction under 4975C1F. So what happens if you enter into a prohibited transaction? Is there an IRA jail? No, it doesn't work that way. But the penalties can be severe. If the IRA catches you doing a prohibited transaction, and that's usually not right away, by the way, then your IRA is, for the IRA owner, the penalty is disqualification of the IRA as of January 1st, the year of the prohibited transaction, plus any taxes, penalties, and interests that you may owe. <clears throat> so as an example here, the IRA may not get caught for years, and Yet the disqualification of the IRA is as, as of January 1st, the year the tr prohibited transaction took place. 
So all that time you thought you were making money tax-free in the IRA, in fact, you should have been reported in on your taxes because it's really money to, belonging to you personally. And therefore, you probably owe taxes, interest penalties, including understatement of income penalties and all that. So it's nasty. Now, there's some interesting discussion about whether there is or is not a statute of limitations on prohibited transactions. Well, there's no direct statute of limitations because here's the way it works. Uh, you have to file some kind of return to start a, a, a uh, statute of limitations. And there's no returns filed uh, typically by IRAs unless you have a 990T tax return for unrelated business income, but that's not what we're talking about here. So in theory, they can go back and look as far as they want to. On the other hand, the penalty for you as an IRA owner is disqualification of the IRA. So one could argue, I suppose, that if the, t the statute of limitations has run for the tax return year that uh, you did the prohibited transaction, that in theory that might not be a prohibited transaction, but there's been a case where they said, well, the trans prohibited transaction was uh, disqualified the IRA and then it stayed in the, the account of the custodian's custodian, so it was treated as a, con a uh, as a contribution, and then the prohibited transaction was a continuous prohibited transaction, so every year it got distributed and recontributed, so you have excess contribution penalties as well as prohibited transaction penalties, so don't think you're getting away with something there, just follow the rules. Also, an interesting case, which has been used several times since, is the Mr. Willis case, Mr. Willis had over a million dollars in his self-directed IRA and he filed bankruptcy. And the bankruptcy trustee and the creditor went through his IRA transactions and found that eight years before the bankruptcy, he had done a prohibited transaction. And because, again, the penalty for doing a prohibited transaction is if the IRA becomes stops becoming an IRA as of January 1st of that year, then... The trustee for the creditor said, well, here's the problem there, dude. And Mr. Willis, that's not an IRA. You just thought it was. And Mr. Willis said, no, 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 no. You're not the IRS. Only the IRS can declare that this is not an IRA. And it went up to the appeals process, and Mr. Willis lost. So now if you file bankruptcy and there's a large dollars amount in your transaction, in your uh, IRA, they may dig through there and see if they can find a prohibited transaction. You may lose your IRA to bankruptcy. Now there's, of course, exemptions in bankruptcy for IRA, but that doesn't count if it's got a prohibited transaction. So be careful. In addition to the penalties for the IRA owner, which is basically disqualified, disqualification of the IRA, any person prohibiting in the, uh, uh, prohibiting, any disqualified person other than the IRA owner participating in the prohibited transaction may be penalized 15% of the amount involved for each year it was outstanding plus 100% if the IRA hasn't caught you yet. So, for example, if you made a loan to your son-in-law because you really didn't like him that much and you made a loan to him and they caught the prohibited transaction, he would be fine. Say it's a $100,000 loan he would be fined 15000 a year for every year that was outstanding, plus 100000 more if they catch him before he corrects it. That's called the taxable period. So these things are just, you don't want to go here. Let me just put it that way. You just don't want to go here. So that's a basic outline. And now we're going to go into some case studies. These are real court cases that I just found interesting. And we're going to go over them kind of quickly because this is kind of the boring part of the talk. And uh, we'll see what they say, see if they, what they have to teach us. So the first case I want to go over is the Edward Appelt case. It's an advisory opinion letter 2006-09A. And what happened is Mr. Appelt had a daughter and son-in-law, and they had a corporation that create, created notes that they then sold to accredited investors. And Mr. Mr. Appelt was an accredited investor, and he wanted to purchase the notes in his IRA. Well, the corporation 
creating the notes was owned 7.5% by his daughter, 87.5% by his son-in-law, and 5% by an unrelated party. And so the question is, can his IRA buy those notes? And the answer was no, because the definition includes, remember I said, a corporation of which 50% or more of the voting power are total shares is owned directly or indirectly by a fiduciary. In this case, the, the way the law works is his daughters and his son-in-laws are both disqualified family members to his IRA. So their ownership of 95% of the corporation is treated or attributed to Mr. Appelt. And therefore, it's as if Mr. Appelt was dealing in his IRA with a corporation owned 95% by him, and you can't do that. So... That's kind of the idea is that ownership by those family members is also attributed to the fiduciary. And so you got to sort of pretend like the ownership by family members is indirect ownership by the IRA owner, in this case, Mr. Appel. The next case I want to go over is the Thomas E. Derrick case, advisory opinion letter, 88-18A. I think this is kind of an interesting one. Mr. Derrick owned a corporation and he was an employee, director, and shareholder. He owned 46.04% of the voting power and 48.14% of the total share to the corporation. Now, if you read those numbers and you remember what I told you that if a fiduciary owns directly or indirectly 50% or more of a disqualified person like a corporation like we're talking about here, then the corporation becomes disqualified. Well, by definition then, if the fiduciary owns less than 50% of the shares or voting power, which is true in this case, then that corporation is not a disqualified person by definition. So the good news is the loan wouldn't violate 4975C1B for the direct or indirect lending of money or the extension of credit. But the conclusion, the conclusion does not preclude the existence of other prohibited transactions. So even though the transaction between Mr. Pelt or Mr. Derrick's IRA and the corporation was not disqualified or prohibited, that doesn't mean that it's not prohibited under another section. So they went on. He has a fiduciary for his IRA. We already know that. And he has a, quote, substantial ownership interest. Therefore, the corporation is a party in whom Mr. Derrick has an interest which may affect his best judgment as a fiduciary for that plan. So it's not like his IRA, he's a fiduciary, he's making a decision to loan money to a company in which he has a substantial interest in. And that's clearly going to affect his best judgment as a fiduciary. So that would be a potential prohibited transaction. And the really bad news is that he is, as a fiduciary, the ruling was that a prohibited use of the plan assets for the benefit of a disqualified person under Section D or E, remember those are the, the really general use by or for the benefit of a disqualified person of the income or assets of a plan, that big language uh, is likely to result if he directs the IRA to loan funds to the corporation because though the corporation is not disqualified, he is, and he's going to benefit indirectly from that transaction. So you can't stop at saying, well, it didn't, it didn't, wasn't a prohibited transaction because the loan was to a non-disqualified person, but because of his ownership interests, it is a potential, in fact, almost definitely a prohibited transaction. Next case. This is kind of a funny one. Oops, sorry. The next case is two attorneys, and basically they represented a builder. And the bank, they formed an S-Corp, and I want to stop right there and just remind everybody that an S-Corp cannot be owned by an IRA except in one very narrow circumstance that we're not going to go into now. So I'm not sure why it said that it was an S-Corp, because once the IRAs became shareholders of the corporation, then it terminated its S-Corp status. So it's only IRAs can only own the C-Corporation, 
as between S and C corporation status. So be careful with that. But anyway, they wanted to have the bank loan money to an IRA-owned corporation. They each owned 50% of it. And the bank was willing to do that only if they offered a personal guarantee of the loan. And then the, with the loan, they were going to buy, as I said, a condominium, um, basically at a pre-construction price, a good price. And so the first thing they held was that a purchase of a condo from an unrelated developer represented by Jason and Burbitt would not be prohibited under the sale, the 4975C1A, the sale, exchange, or lease of an asset between a plan and a disqualified person. But the personal guarantee of the mortgage would be prohibited under lending of money and other extension of credit. And so they were going like, no, 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 you don't understand. We're not guaranteeing the money on behalf of the IRA. We're guaranteeing money on behalf of the entity owned by the IRA. And the court said, sorry, the lending of money to an IRA owned entity is the same thing as lending money to the IRA directly as far as the prohibited transaction rules go. Then they went into a, a another holding where they said under the plan asset regulations that the violation of D or E, those are the bro really broad benefit sections, would occur if the transaction was part of an agreement arrangement or understanding which the fiduciary, the IRA owners, Mr. Burbitt and Mr. Jason, uh, caused the plan to be used in a manner to des designed to benefit such fiduciary. In other words, if they're directing the IRA, the, uh, IRA to invest in the S Corp so they, they can get the loan so that the builder will sell them a cheap condo and it's coming back to them indirectly, that's still going to be a problem. So anyway, let's move on. I kind of like this one. This is a, a friend of mine and I had an argument and this one settled it. So the Warfields, basically what happened is the Donald and Betty Warfield had bought years ago an eight unit apartment building, which was purchased with a loan from Chase Bank. And now the bank is willing to sell that loan. And Mr. Warfield wanted to know if he could buy that loan in his self-directed IRA. And the, the holding was very interesting. And it's a very important point here in this case. And as, as in the Department of Labor's view, a loan is a transaction that continues from the time it is made until all amounts due are paid. The debtor-creditor debtor relationship continues throughout the duration of the extension of credit. As a result, the relationship of the parties must be examined throughout the course of the loan to determine whether a disqualified person relationship exists. And that a prohibited extension of the credit under C-1B will exist between Mr. Warfield's IRA and the Warfields personally, who are disqualified persons, of course, of the, as to the IRA, once the IRA acquires the note from the bank. In addition, and that's because the IRA would owe money to a disqualified person, uh, or they would owe money to the IRA, I'm sorry, the other way around. In addition, the holding of the note by the IRA will continue to be a prohibited transaction as long as payments on the note are made by the Warfields or any other disqualified person. So there's the problem that even though the transaction, and this is a real lesson from this case, even though the transaction was fine in the beginning because the Warfields clearly could loan, borrow money from Chase Bank and those weren't two disqualified persons together, the minute that loan got transferred to Mr. Warfield's IRA, it became a prohibited transaction because now the Warfields owed Mr. Warfield's IRA and that's an impermissible loan. So that's how tricky this thing can get. Now this is a bounds case. I think this is a very interesting case because it shows the sensitivity that the IRS has for transactions that may be with persons that affect your best judgment as a fiduciary. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Bounds, he was vice president of a division of Rock 10, a big company, not of the whole thing, but of a division of Rock 10. And his family owned less than 2% personally of the um, company. 
and they were offering additional shares and he wanted his IRAs or the IRAs of his family, him and his wife, to purchase four, 400 shares of the company. And he wanted to know whether that was okay. And so they analyzed it. And the good news is that the company is not disqualified under the definition of a disqualified person, 4975B2G, because the, if the bounds would own less than 2% of all the outstanding shares, even after the purchase by the IRAs. So Rock 10 is also not a disqualified person under 4975B2C because the term employer, this is what I mentioned earlier, the term employer is interpreted to mean only an employer who is maintaining, sponsoring, or contributing directly to the IRA. So the uh, wasn't disqualified either under the definition of an employer or as the corporation. So that would not mean that a sale between of the stock between the company and Mr. Bounds IRA would not violate C1A, the sale, purchase, or exchange of uh, assets between a disqualified person and the plan. But the potential bad news is that they analyze it that Mr. and Mrs. Bounds are, of course, as we've discussed, fiduciaries as to their IRAs. In addition, Mr. Bounds is an officer of Rock 10, and the Bounds have stock ownership personally. Accordingly, the, the Department of Labor said, the purchases of stock may involve violations of the really broad indirect benefit rules of 4975C1D or E, but the Department of Labor will not generally issue opinions with respect to inherently factual matters. In other words, we're not going to tell you. We're not going to tell you if you're safe because we only give legal uh, rulings, not factual, inherently factual rulings. And the question is, is Rock 10 a, an entity in which Mr. Bounds has a interest in which would affect his best judgment as a fiduciary? So uh, that's a very sensitive kind of, shows you how sensitive they can get. I would vote that this would not be a problem, but then that's not an opinion I'm allowed to take. So let's go on. Uh, one of the most interesting cases is the case of Rollins versus Commissioner. And Joseph Rollins was a CPA, a registered investment advisor, a benefits specialist, and trustee of his own solo 401k plan. And he has also had several co corporations that did some development and things like that. And Mr. Rollins was always the largest shareholder and an officer of the corporation, but always a minority shareholder. So the companies in which he loaned money to, he was an officer of and the largest shareholder, but the companies were clearly not disqualified because he didn't own more than a requisite 50% of or more of. And he loaned the monies at 12% interest from his 401k to these companies, and the loans were all repaid. So everything was good, he thought. But then he got caught, and the court analyzed it, and it was an extensive holding. It's a, a long case, and it's very interesting to read the whole case if you're into that kind of stuff. But they ruled that, of course, Mr. Rollins was a disqualified person as to the trustee of the 401k, because he was, well, the trustee, and he was a 100% owner of the CPA firm, so and he was the only participant. So clearly he was disqualified as to the 401k. And he made the decision to loan the money as trustee of the 401k, and he signed the notes for the borrowers, which were, again, he was the largest shareholder and officer, but not a majority shareholder. So the court said, hey, you sat on both sides of the table, and that's inherent disqual uh, inherently conflict of interest. And then they said, well, we believe that Mr. Rollins derived the benefit as a significant part owner of the borrowers from borrowing the money without having to deal with independent lenders. That certainly can be an advantage. I guess you could argue that. They said Rollins might not have derived the benefit. In other words, they allowed for the possibility that you could not derive the benefit. But here's the key. But the burden of proof was on Mr. Rollins to prove he didn't receive a benefit, which he failed to do in this case. Wow. So in order to, if you land in tax court, 
and they're saying, well, you got a benefit. You now have the burden to prove that you didn't get a benefit. And he failed to do that. So the loans were deemed to be prohibited transactions under 4971, 75C1D, which are transferred to or used by or for the benefit of disqualified persons of the income assets of the land. The disqualified person in this case was Mr. Rollins. It wasn't the corporation themselves because they were not disqualified. This gets really tricky. Now here's one that I, I really feel bad about because this is Mr. Leonard Adler. And Mr. Adler, he was trying to do the right thing. Uh, he wanted to invest in Bernard Madoff Securities. Yes, that's the Bernard we're talking about. Oh, Bernie Madoff with all my money. And so he wanted to form a family partnership which includes Mr. Adler's IRA and other family members and they wanted to make a new limited partnership and have that limited partnership invest with Bernie, Bernie Madoff. So this ruling came out and boy, people got really kind of excited about it because, you know, Mr. Adler, because of the ruling, but they didn't read far enough. So we'll go into that now. Now, the ruling of the case turns out that you may be able to partner with your IRA in an investment made simultaneously in certain circumstances, and it wouldn't typically violate 4975C1A, sale, purchase, or exchange of an asset between an IRA and a disqualified person. So, because there's nothing being bought, because you're going in same time, side by side. But, remember what I said earlier is that a prohibited transaction, a transaction may be prohibited under more than one section, and so we got to look at the whole thing. The next thing they do, what everybody got excited about, it said a prohibited transaction under 4975 C1D or E, the really broad definitions of uh, in benefit, will not occur merely because fiduciary drives some incidental benefit from a transaction involving the IRA assets. Well, everybody said, hey, that's that's great. I can participate in investments with my IRA as long as I don't derive more than an incidental benefit. But they didn't, they forgot to keep on reading. So let's keep on looking at the ruling. However, oh, however, always you got to watch out for that language. A prohibited transaction would occur under those same sections if the transaction was part of an arrangement, agreement, or understanding in which a fiduciary, including the IRA owner, causes plan assets to be used in a manner designed to benefit such fiduciary or any other person in whom such fiduciary has an interest with respect to exercise of his best judgment as fiduciary. So they're going to like, wait a minute, but if you're doing entering into this transaction and trying to get some benefit that's more than just an incidental benefit. You, you can, you can, this is a dangerous type of thing to do is what they're trying to say. So then, then they go into the thing where they said, if the IRA causes the IRA to enter into a transaction where by the terms or nature of that transaction, a conflict of interest between the IRA and the fiduciary or persons in whom he has an interest exists or will arise in the future, that transaction would violate either 4975C1D or E. So that's pretty strong language. If you're going to do something that's going to create a conflict of interest either now or in the future, that would violate 4975C1D or E. Wow. So we're getting uh, hotter and hotter here. If you participate in your investment with the IRA, and this is a key key, very, very important holding and probably the most important thing to me, besides the fact that you may be able to do it if you derive no more than an incidental benefit. But if you participate in an investment with your IRA, you must not rely upon and cannot be otherwise dependent upon the participation of the IRA in order for you or persons in whom you have an interest to undertake or continue your share of the investment. Hmm. Hmm. So what do we think of that? Well, let me give you an example. I invested in a bank one time, 
and turned out really, really good. It took 11 years, but we sold the bank eventually and it turned out to be very well. And the minimum investment for that initial subscription of the stock was $50,000. So I put up $50,000 personally and my IRA put up $50,000. Actually, it was my 401k, but whatever. And so I was less than a 1% shareholder in the whole thing. And so the terms were equal. I went in side by side. I was very careful to go in side by side. And I got no extra benefit from pers investing personally versus with my IRA or my 401k. So that was couldn't be deemed to be any more than an incidental benefit. But I said the minimum was 50000 and I met the $50,000 threshold with both personal investment and separately with my 401k. Now, if the minimum was 50000 and I only had 25000 and I needed 25000 to do the transaction, could I have taken 25000 personally and 25000 from the IRA or 401k and done the deal? The answer is no, because I couldn't have done that deal without the participation of the other party and vice versa between my IRA and 401k and me. So you can see how that's a situation that gets very tempting. And finally, they make the point that I've made now several times, which is even if it's at its inception, a transaction did not involve a violation, if a divergence of interest develops between the IRA and the fiduciary, the fiduciary must take steps to eliminate the conflict of interest in order to to avoid engaging in a prohibited transaction. So this stuff gets really tricky. Finally, we're going to talk about, I think this is the last one, not, yeah. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about the Miles Berry case. Now, Miles Berry thought he was very clever. He owned a company called Esco, Esco and Esco was owned 68% by him personally, 32% by somebody called George personally, and Robert is the controller of ESCO. Uh, so let's analyze that now. Are all these parties disqualified persons as to Mr. Um, Barry's IRA? The answer is yes. Let's see why. It's because Mr. Barry's IRA, Mr. Barry is a fiduciary to his IRA, that makes sense, right? So as a fiduciary, he owns 50% or more of the stock of S Corp, right? So as owner of 50% more of S Corp, personally, that means that ESCO, ESCO, I'll try to call it ESCO, is disqualified person under 4975E2G. Okay, that's fine. So we understand that. He owned more than 50% of the company, so ESCO is disqualified to his IRA. Fine. Next thing, because ESCO is a disqualified person, George is a 10% or more partner in ESCO, and so George is also a disqualified person as to Mr. Barry's IRA. And Robert, as the controller and officer of ESCO, is also a disqualified person under 4975E2H. So you got three disqualified persons and a disqualified company. Now the proposal was that Mr. Miles Berry would have his IRA invest 49% of, of an LLC. Robert would invest 31% and George personally, I'm sorry, Robert's IRA would invest 31% and George personally would invest the 20%. So then the question is, let's look at the LLC. Well, so you've got 80% of the LLC is owned by a disqualified person, uh, or rather 80% is owned by IRAs of disqualified persons to Mr. Barry's IRA. But what the deal was is Mr. Barry wanted the LLC to build a warehouse and lease that property back to ESCO. So he wanted to go around the rules by making him, his IRA own less than 50%, and therefore he figured he could get the LLC to build a warehouse and then lease it back to his own ESCO that started the whole 
process and he wanted to know if that was okay. So, well, let's analyze it. We've already analyzed why each of those parties is a disqualified person. And so there's something that called the plan asset regulations, and there's the site there in the second paragraph, that when an entity is ignored, basically the entity is ignored for purposes of the prohibited transaction rules, the IRA is deemed basically to be doing the transaction in directly. And so when the plan asset regulations do not apply, including when a plan invests in, in an entity as part of an arrangement or understanding under which it is expected that the entity will engage in a transaction with a disqualified person. Okay, so the purpose of investing into the LLC is to build a warehouse, which they're going to enter into a lease back to ESCO. So that's a transaction. The LLC is going to enter into a transaction that will benefit a disqualified person indirectly by having the LLC build a warehouse and lease it back. And so the holding ended up like this. It says, because it appears that Mr. Berry's LL IRA will invest in the LLC under an arrangement or understanding that anticipates that the LLC will then turn around and engage in a lease with Mr. Berry's ESCO, which is a disqualified person for the, re the reasons we described, the lease would amount to a prohibited transaction between Berry's IRA and his corporation under 4975C1 A and D, A being sale, lease, or exchange of property between IRA and a disqualified person, and D and E uh, being, of course, the general uh, broad, if you get any direct or indirect benefit rules, that's going to apply. So even though Mr. Uh, Barry thought he was cleverly designing this transaction because ultimately he directed his IRA to an LLC, which was going to build a warehouse, which was going to come back and lease it to his ESCO, it was still a prohibited transaction. Now, we're finally going to discuss, just really super briefly, three cases that are related to the idea of checkbook control IRA-owned entity, which comes from the original case of Swanson versus Commissioner. But these are some subsequent ruling. And at Quest Trust Company, we don't allow our customers to be the IRA, uh, the officer, director, trustee, or manager of an entity owned by their IRA, which is commonly sometimes called a checkbook control IRA. And the reason is, includes these three cases, so they're just something to look at. The first case we want to look at, and I'm just summarizing these real super quick, is it Repetto versus Commissioner. In the Repetto case, the Repettos owned a construction business and, along with some partners, and they formed two Roth IRA Corporation, and they started working for those Roth IRA corporations and provided services to the construction business. Now, the problem was that they didn't change their positions or do anything different. The Roth IRA owned corporations uh, had their address at the same place where their home was and they provided services to the uh, construction company. Well, the court ruled that, that was just a sham transaction, an abusive Roth IRA transaction, because all they were trying to do was shift the value of their services indirectly into the Roth IRA by virtue of these Roth IRA corporations. And so that's not a real transaction, that's a sham transaction, and it is abusive of Roth IRA rules. So it's a very interesting case. It has some good parts to it, too. But the ruling as far as uh, the check of control idea was, was fall down. Now, the Peak, versus Fleck, Peak and Fleck versus Commissioner, that's a really interesting case, too. Peak and, Mr. Peak and Mr. Fleck formed an entity owned 50% each 
by each of their IRAs. So no, neither one of them owned more than 50%, and that has to do something with, with plan asset regulations. But anyway, and the, the, the corporation that they formed owned each, each of their IRAs owned 50% of, turned around and purchased another business. And then Mr. Peak and Mr. Fleck proceeded to, to uh, work for that business. And they frankly did all kinds of prohibited transactions. But the way court system works is if they got you on one, and they really got you on one, they don't have to go and analyze the other one. Because I heard some people when analyzing this case say, oh, they almost got away with it except for they provided a personal guarantee. Well, that's not true at all. Because, in fact, the uh, there were many prohibited transactions. I went and read the actual pleadings in the case and the whole thing. They had them dead to rights in many ways. But one of the things they had them dead to rights on was that they personally guaranteed the loan, uh, the seller finance loan for their IRA-owned entity to purchase the business. And the court said, that's clearly a prohibited transaction. And they said, no, that's not. We didn't, we didn't own more than 50% of the entity each. And so we were working for and extended our credit to the IRA-owned corporation, not the IRA itself. And then, as we've already seen previously, no, that doesn't work because a transaction that is to an IRA-owned entity is going to be the same thing as to a transaction with the IRA directly, and they could not have worked for their IRA. They could not have extended credit for their IRA, as we discussed earlier. Finally, Mr. Ellis formed a limited liability company for the purpose of operating a used car business. It doesn't really sound like a great uh, use of your IRA money to me, but whatever. He was the manager of the LLC and the business and the only, and the business of the LLC and the business and the only employee, and he paid himself. And the court said, no, that's a prohibited transaction because Mr. Ellis received a salary from the LLC and therefore was receiving a personal benefit from his IRA's investment. These are just really quick summaries of complicated facts, some patterns, and you got to understand that the whole idea of checkbook control is filled with danger and we don't have time. This is We could spend the whole hour on peak and fleck and I don't have time to do that. But I can assure you that there's not, it's not a crisp, clean washing machine for prohibited transactions. In fact, you're more likely to inadvertently do a prohibited transaction if you don't know all the rules in a checkbook control IRA owned entity. So anyway, just a real quick summary of those. So bottom line is that that's uh, our presentation for today. I really wish I could have done this live because it's so much fun to do this talk live, even though it's not very good at promoting self-directed IRAs because I'm just telling you the things you cannot do. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation and learned something from it. Remember, we can't give you tax, legal, investment, or deal structuring advice, but we do have IRA specialists who you can call and kind of kick the can around and see if uh, we can push you in the right direction. So I want to thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And give me a, you can email me at quincy.long at questtrust.com or go to our website where we have lots of these educational sessions at questtrust.com, or call us at 855-FUN-IRAs, because we really do think self-directed IRAs are fun. That's 855-386-4727. Thank you, and have a good day.